Hey there, and welcome. Uh, on behalf of Still Creek Church, we're so glad that you're here. Currently, we're in a series journeying through the book of Romans, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so today's message is gonna be one of those installments along the way. We believe in the local church and being in, in being a part of the body of Christ in a tangible way. And so if you're looking for a place to land, we'd love for you to learn more, find more sermons and other spiritual resources and how to get connected to Still Creek Church by visiting stillcreek.org. We hope you enjoy the message and we know that God has something in store for you today. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set aside for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints grace to you and the peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ the Apostle Paul wrote to the Roman Christians both Jews and Gentiles about the glorious gospel the word gospel simply means good news I like to call it the great news great news it was the good news of Jesus Christ dying on a cross for not some but all of our sins that whoever should call upon his name shall be saved by the grace of God and how many of you today are grateful for the gospel of Jesus that saved our souls amen praise the Lord the greatest gift that you will ever receive and the greatest gift that you will ever, ever offer to someone else. And this is why the Apostle Paul, known as the gospel, known as the, the, known as the apostle of the Gentiles, although Jewish, desired to share the gospel, certainly, certainly with this fellow Jewish family, but also because of the revelation of Jesus Christ and him understanding under the new covenant that this glorious gospel was now being extended to the Gentiles, God has now made out of the two one, one in Messiah. And so if you were not here last week, let me encourage you to go online and listen to the first part of Romans chapter 1. We're, we're continuing our study today. In, in verses 18 through the end of the chapter. We ended last week with the Apostle Paul declaring that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. The power unto God and the salvation. To the Jew first and then the Gentile. And he very clearly made the statement that we're all saved by the grace of God through faith. It's not of works. Nobody earned their salvation. Salvation is free. Salvation is free. Would you say those words out loud with me? Salvation is free. But how much does it cost you to live the Christian life? <laughs> it should cost us everything. We surrender all unto Jesus. And Paul continues this teaching in a very powerful one. And I've asked the Lord today to not only empower me to teach this these scriptures accurately but with the right tone the right tone the tone of great conviction and yet also a tone of love because this gospel message was not delivered to condemn people it was delivered to give people in sin hope hope for we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one person was born sinless. We were born into sin and we were born broken. 
That's why we all needed a Savior. And that's why all today still need a Savior. What we must be careful of in our culture today, just like the first century church that Paul was writing to, was not to be accused of suppressing the truth. And we are living in a day and age where the truth, unfortunately, is being suppressed. And we're exchanging the truth of God for a lie. We're no different than any generation, though. The first century church found itself in a culture that was doing the very same things that we're doing today. And yet there's a great penalty to pay for suppressing the truth. So as we walk through the book of Romans, I said last week, and I'll reaffirm it today, I want you to learn something as we walk through these books of the Bible. As we especially walk through now the book of Romans, I want you to learn and to allow these truths to penetrate your heart, not just for academic knowledge, let it penetrate your heart for transformation and life change. No matter what your flesh may be struggling with today, the power of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit can overcome any weakness of the flesh. And it must be addressed in the power of the Holy Spirit and not through, quote, human willpower. The Holy Spirit is powerful enough to overcome any sin that we may be struggling with. He is with us. How many of you can testify that God has given you power over the weaknesses of your flesh? He is powerful. That's why we're, that's why we needed to be born again. We were born into sin and broken, and that's why the Bible teaches us we must be born again. And so Paul continues with this introduction, and what a powerful introduction it is. He says, again, you're saved by grace through faith. But then, beginning in verse 18, he begins to give a reality of the total character of God. God is indeed love. God is indeed gracious and merciful. God is also very, very holy. And his holiness demands righteousness and justice. And this is why the Apostle Paul, understanding the total character of God, and this is why we, it's very important that the church understand, don't, don't attempt to divide his character and just say that God is just all love. He is all love, but he is also always gracious merciful but he's also always holy he's all of these combined and that is why the apostle paul could make the statement for the wrath of god wrath means actually the anger or the vengeance of god we often don't view god in that type of light but he loves people But sin must be addressed. That is why the Bible says God so loved the world that he sent, he gave his only begotten son to be your sin on a cross, to pay for those sins. But for those that reject that offer, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Not just some, but all ungodliness. So let me just say, at the beginning of this message, let's not attempt to rewrite Scripture to fit our lifestyle. Let's allow the Scriptures to dictate our lifestyles and to submit our lives under Him and to the Word of God. All ungodliness, if it's not addressed through Jesus, the wrath of God will not only be revealed, it will be experienced by every person. I mean, I have, I'm just now getting started, and I thank God that as a Christian, I will not experience the wrath of God. How about you? As a Christian, as a Christian, praise God. 
People may mock the judgment of God, but they will not be mocking forever. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Suppress the truth means to hold back or to hinder or to restrain the truth. You knew it, but now you're suppressing it. This is a sin and a great and grievous sin to suppress the truth of God, to try to rewrite or reinterpret what God has said to fit your ideology or your philosophy of life or what you think is best, how mankind should function. God did not ask us how we thought it should function. He has told us clearly how it should function through his word. And the, the today, this is an issue that we're still facing. It was happening in the first century. It's happening now in the 21st century of people believing they know more than God and beginning to hinder and to restrict and even suppress the truth. But let me declare unto you, God's truth cannot be suppressed. You can deny it. You can try to reject it. But it's not up for debate. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Plain to them. All the way back from Adam and Eve and to every generation since. This is why, again, because of the universal corruption of mankind because of sin, all are in need of the gospel. All are in need. They also includes both Jew and Gentile because they were equally corrupt in every pagan nation. Unfortunately, even the nation of Israel, although they had the oracles of God, they did not follow the oracles of God. And they became corrupt, corrupt as a nation as well. But I love this, I love this, I love what Paul is, is beginning to teach here. He did it in Acts chapter 17 as well. Paul was probably the greatest theologian, the greatest debater, but yet he pointed to something where there will be no excuse for mankind not to bow their knee to God and to acknowledge him as not only the God of creation, but their very God as well. He says, this is very plain because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes. Why? Because God is spirit. They may be invisible, but they are very tangible. <laughs> you know them. Namely, his eternal power and divine nature. God is all-powerful. He is divine having been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So here is the Apostle Paul, the great theologian, the scholar of the Old Testament, the relayer of the New Testament under grace, knowing the Bible, knowing God's heart, but he points to creation. He points to creation as proof text that God is God. So this is something so simplistic. For every person in this sanctuary, every person online, you do not have to be a theologian to prove that God exists and that God is divine and God is powerful. You just go outside in just a few moments and look at the sky, look at the trees, Look at the mountains when you get an opportunity. Look at, the, look at the ocean. Look at the stars tonight. Look at the moon, the sun, and declare that God exists and that God is the creator of all things. He says just, just by looking at creation, they and we are without excuse. The title of today's message is No Excuses. There are no excuses 
for any person to reject God as the creator, the sustainer, and the savior of the world. Just by creation. This to me is so powerful. And we get intimidated by attempting to evangelize lost people. This is so simple. Just tell your family. Just walk with me outside right now. And have them look around. And look at every tree and every bush, every blade of grass. How does that happen? Look at the stars, the moon, the sun. God is powerful and he is divine. And he is showing you tangibly that he exists. He exists. And you are without excuse. Period. Man, I could end the message right now to be in a good word. I love this. I love it. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, help me out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's not hard to understand. People want to debate. They want to debate evolution. They want to debate all these theories, how we came to be. Why don't you just submit? It's easier to believe the Bible than to believe all these other theories. God created the heavens and the earth. God is eternal. He's always been. God could not be created because he is the creator. He created the heavens and the earth. I love this. So many galaxies that we can't even comprehend. I love Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Just go outside, look at the heavens, and declare His glory. He exists, He's alive, He's powerful, and He's the God of the universe. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Men on clear nights, how can you deny that there is a Creator? How can you look outside and see the stars and the moon and think that somehow this just happened? You've heard this before. A lot of people believe in the Big Bang Theory. Well, so do I. God said it and spoke it into existence, and bang, it happened. It happened. It happened. His handiwork on display of every mountain you see, the beautiful clouds, the beautiful mountains. And I don't know if you're a mountain person or if you might be like me and you're a beach person. The beautiful coastline, understanding high tide and low tide, even how that happens. God is so detailed. Yes, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And if you don't get anything else out of this message today, I'm asking you to receive what has just been taught and don't ever, ever feel like you cannot evangelize or witness to a lost person. Drag them outside and show them who God is by declaring his glory through creation. Amen? Praise the Lord. But he doesn't stop there. For although they knew God in a general sense, the original experiential knowledge of God, how many of you know that you can know about God, even believe he exists without submitting to him? It's happening right now in our culture. It's happened in every generation since creation. Knowledge of God has, was their knowledge. They knew him in that experiential sense, but they did not bow to him. They suppressed the truth of God, and this pattern continues to this very day. There are many who acknowledge God, hear me, 
to only give way to their intolerant and humanistic teaching and philosophies of men. And it's happening today. And unfortunately, we become futile in our minds. For although they, and even people today, knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts. This is Paul's language. Foolish hearts, futile thinking, stinking thinking, outside of the Bible. They were darkened. This darkness still hovers over our country and many other cultures that have, quote, progressed. We are progressing into fools if we neglect the word of Almighty God and who He is. Claiming to be wise, help me, church, they became fools. They became fools. Why? Because they exchanged the truth for the, of the, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. For a lie. We have taken the bait. We've exchanged something very beautiful, very rich, very truthful, and we are exchanging it for something that's false in our culture. Don't let it happen to you. I'm even watching it happen in the church. Men and women who proclaim to know God, teaching the exact opposite of what God says. This is why I want you to always come to the house of God with your Bibles or your devices. Let's turn into the Bible to see what God has to say and not what man has to say. We've exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Once idolatry begins to happen and you begin to suppress truth, you begin to, you be, you begin to commit idolatry, which means you put you put something before God. It could be a human being. It could be material things. It could be even be animals, which was happening in this, these cultures, and even cultures around the country, beginning to deify man, beginning to make animals sacred. These are all lies. We begin to serve the creature, the people that, the people or animals that God has made instead of the creator. Yes, help us. Help us, Lord. Who is the blessed forever? Our creator, God Almighty. Our Father is the blessed forever. Amen, church? And amen. So this is why it is so, so critically important that you are very careful who you listen to. You know, in the days of, of Greece and the Roman Empire and all these philosophers that wanted to sit around and just expand on their knowledge and attempt to espouse their knowledge to other people, all the way from Socrates to Aristotle to Plato to many others that you would see statues about because they were so humanistic and so smart. to Karl Marx and even more modern philosophers such as Bertrand Russell who just died in the 1970s. I believe it was the year of 1970. And Bertrand Russell was famous for making the statement after he was asked, if you stand before God after you die, what are you going to say to him about Romans 1? He was quoted not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. Wow. I will assure you that Bertrand Russell believes in God today. But it was too late. Too late. There, there are no unbelievers in hell. They know there's a God the moment you die. The moment you die. All will know that God is God. And God exists. Another man named Christopher Hitchens wrote a book called God's Not Great. Well, he knows today that God is great. 
Maybe some of you have heard of a man named Richard Dawkins. He's still alive today, 79 years old. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. A lot of atheists read his material. He will one day know without a doubt that God was not a delusion. He's 79, he's still alive, and we pray for his salvation to come to understand who Jesus is, for those blinders to be removed before it's too late. God is not a delusion. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he is our creator. He made all of us in his image. So also, if you want to just know that there's God, just look in the mirror. He made you in his image. He is God. And all of these men and women who think they know more than God and think they're so wise, they have become fools. How many fools are there in our country today? How many fools do you know personally? Now, again, it doesn't go well when you call people names. I'm only quoting the Bible here. But the reality is that people that do not bow to Christ are foolish. They're foolish. And I want us as believers to know the Bible that we might be able to impart truth into people who still have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. Because the reality is before we became wise in Christ, every person in this sanctuary, every person online that is a Christian, we were those fools. And how many of you are thankful today that we are now fools for Christ? Fools for Christ. We stand for him. He is so real. He shows you every day how real he is when you look in the mirror. He shows you how real he is when you step outside of your house. He even shows you how real he is when you're inside your house and can have drink, clean drinking water and food and clothing. He's a God that provides as well. Come on, give God glory of who he is. He is God. He is God. But because people have suppressed the truth, not only in this century, in the first century, but even today, the Bible says, and God gave them up. God gave them up. We go from idolatry to worshiping man with all their sculptures and idols Many of the Roman emperors believed they were little gods. So once you begin to put any person, any king, any animal, any material position, possession above God, it's idolatry. So once you begin to embrace idolatry and humanistic thinking, the next step is a short one to immorality. Immorality. When man becomes his own god, he or she believes they can do anything they want. Does that sound familiar to where we live today? This is where we are. This is not just only history. This teaching is applicable for us today. He uses the words he gave them up three times before I'll end this message. The word there, gave them up, means he permitted. He did not make them. He allowed them because of their persistence in sin. He said, I give you up. You want to sin? I give you up. I give you permission. I'm permitting it. I'm not going to control you. I've given you the truth. I've shown you who I am. You're suppressing the truth. Now I'm giving you up. I'm giving you up to the lust of your hearts, to dishonorable passions, and to disobedience. I'm going to give you up. And that is what has happened in every generation since including ours. See, God has given them up. He's given them up for dishonorable passions. The word there, dishonorable, means insult or shame. Dishonorable. And what ended up happening is it began to immediately evolve into sexual sin. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. 
contrary to nature, how you were originally designed. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. See, when you embrace idolatry, you begin to embrace immorality. And although this particular passage is obviously dealing with homosexual sex, you, you see the Bible also condemning heterosexual sex outside the bonds of marriage. Sin is sin, and I want you to hear this today, and I, this is why I ask God for the right tone. I don't want us to be the church or a church that just rails against sin without giving people hope. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're born broken. And we're, our, our flesh is drawn to all types of perversion. And this is why it is critically important that we embrace the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit to have the power to say no to sin, regardless of how your flesh is leading you. And this is why we also must have conviction that we do not allow us or anyone else to tempt us to suppress the truth because culture is going one way and the church is going another. I want you to remember this and not to be ugly about it and not to be arrogant about it, but this is why it is important to understand. God calls homosexual sex unnatural. And the reason why it is unnatural is because the body wasn't designed for homosexual sex. And the body was designed for heterosexual sex, but only that is to be practiced under the sacred banner of holy matrimony. How far our culture is going. I mean, Paul uses some very strong words here, adjectives, shameless or shameful. When you use those words today in our culture, you will be viewed as a hater. Why don't you become more wise? Why don't you get with the times and become more progressive? See, progressiveness in that area leads to foolishness. And it was just like the first century. We're dealing with it now in the 21st century. And I am saying to any person, I want you to hear this, every person online, every person in the sanctuary, my heart breaks, my heart breaks for many in the church that struggle with same-sex attraction. It breaks for it. Matter of fact, I am confident there's some of you here that not only have struggled, you may still be struggling. But I also know this, I have watched many, many, repent of it because they know the scriptures are true and they have asked the Holy Spirit to give them power to say no to their flesh. And that's not just people who struggle with same-sex attraction. Heterosexual sin. To give us the power in the Holy Spirit to say no is available only in the power of the Holy Spirit. But with him, all things are possible. And many of you here today are testimonies to the power of the gospel in the Holy Spirit. Amen to that? But yet we have to deal with culture. My role as a pastor is to equip you. Is to equip you. And I, I want you to hear this. No amount of effort from our culture Hollywood or our government will ever, ever change Romans chapter 1. It does not matter. No amount of humanistic teaching, persuasion, commercials, television, movies, even liberal Bible teachers can change the fact that practicing homosexual sin or heterosexual sin is normal. 
It is not. It is called sin. It needs to be repented of. And hallelujah, here's the good news, the great news of the gospel, is that it can be repented of and it can be overcome in the name of Jesus. Amen, church? So we want to give hope for any parents that are struggling with your children in this area. Maybe you're struggling. We want to be a safe place here at this church to minister to people that truly want to obey God in righteousness. And acknowledging that I still have flesh that needs to be addressed in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want us to be a place where every person can come and not be judged, but will be imparted with love, grace, mercy, and the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Amen, church? But you will never, ever offer people hope with the gospel if you do not believe that sin is still sin. Hear what I just said. If you do not believe it, and what is happening to us in our culture is our culture is attempting with everything they have to normalize sexual perversion. To normalize it. It's not normal. It's not natural. Words of the Bible. It's actually shameful. And this is a huge issue today, today, even this week. The House has just passed the Equality Act. Now, I want to equip you here. Stay with me, and I'm going to close. Stay with me. The Equality Act. Now, that sounds really beautiful and right. And let me say, regardless regardless of a person's color of skin, gender, or choice of lifestyle. Every person deserves to be treated with respect and to not be discriminated against and never to be treated poorly. I believe that. We treat people with respect to not discriminate. Yet, that does not mean that all lifestyles are acceptable to God or His people. That's the difference. That's the difference. We should respect all people. They're objects of God's love. We should not discriminate. We should not treat them poorly. But we must love people enough to tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us, God, and to so help them. I just Googled this week. You could do this exercise. It's fascinating of the gender choices that are now available for people to choose. And I never could really get the right number. You know why? Because it's always evolving. Because, quote, we're always progressing. Somewhere between 50 and 62 gender choices are available. In addition to, quote, your, quote, assigned gender. Now, and I, re- I read those words, assigned gender. Well, I wonder who assigned your gender. And look, I, I could go on and on. I'm, I'll, I just want to try to help us to navigate through this without arrogance. This is very important. God created male and female in his image. Now listen, there are only two genders. There always have been and there always will be. That is what the scriptures teach. And listen, although we may applaud this, I will assure you that what I've just shared will not be applauded in the public school system, in the universities, in Hollywood, probably many of your neighbors. It's because we have suppressed the truth. And when you suppress the truth, you then begin to make up things as you want them to be. You begin to rewrite the Bible. You begin to, again, to attempt to create a culture that fits your lifestyle instead of 
allowing the God of creation to impart to you how he made you and you submit to him and you submit your lifestyle unto him. It's backwards. It's backwards. And we have become fools and foolish. This, this is foolishness to get a piece of paper and give you 52 choices or more. What? And people want you to buy into this nonsense? This is what Paul preached in the first century. I ask you, is this as applicable today as it ever has been? Absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, Gen Z, the younger generation, I mean, I just read this. We talked about it as pastors this week. One out of six young people are identifying with something other than male or female. Again, you have to be taught that. You have to be influenced by somebody or some system. You will never get that from God. So I ask us today to have great empathy for people who really struggle with this sexual identity. Not to be condescending, not to be hurtful, not to name call, but never to compromise how God made that person to be. And to always call people to a higher standard of righteousness and holiness and not get caught up in this degradation and perversion that our culture is embracing. There will be penalties for that. And this is how Paul ends the letter. It wasn't just sexual sin. He gave them up to a list of 21 other sins. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Not only were they filled that way, we're in the same boat today in our culture. Evil, covetousness, always wanting more, wanting what somebody else has, malice. Wow, we can be some mean people. They are full of envy, murder, murder in the womb, murder outside of it. We'll kill somebody to steal dogs now. Kill somebody over a frivolous fight, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, when you're violent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. I mean, Paul took time under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to name them. And though they know God's righteousness decree, and what's sad today, many people who are practicing these sins from idolatry to immorality, many of them raised in Christian homes. They knew the Bible stories, know them but now suppressing them, thinking they've become enlightened and you're now more progressive. Progressive. No, progression doesn't always mean advancement. It can mean more foolishness. And he ends like this. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, the word practice there is a continuous action. You can read that list of sins and realize that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But it's if we continue to practice them with no conviction, no repentance, that those who practice such things deserve to what? To die, not only physically, but spiritually. Church, this is a very powerful teaching today. My heart's broken. That's why I ask God, God, give me 
the right conviction and the right tone. Not to just stand here and rail against sin without giving people hope. We've all sinned. I just pray, God, for people to be awakened, for the blinders to be lifted. Sin has consequences. They have earthly consequences, and they certainly have eternal consequences. They deserve to die. We don't want anybody dying unnecessarily on our watch. We must preach the good news of the gospel because in the power of the gospel, there's victory over sin. There's victory over our flesh. But watch how he ends. They not only do them, even though those who say they know the Bible, they not only practice these sins, but give approval to those who practice them. Please don't be the ones who say, we believe the Bible, but you also give a wink-wink to those who practice sin. We cannot give approval. We can't do it. Why? Because love doesn't permit us to. Love. Love for people says, no, I will love you enough to not approve of this. I will love you enough to give you hope of the gospel. I will love you enough to speak the truth in love. You see, Romans chapter 1, if not already in the minds and hearts of most of the culture, is hate speech. And who knows where our government's going to take this. Romans 1 might even be outlawed one day in America. I don't know. Right now I can guarantee you it's outlawed in most people's hearts. Because they'll consider it you're a hater. Oh, no, my friend. Oh, no. Quite the opposite. A true friend. A true friend. Come on. A true friend is going to tell you the truth. A true believer. A true believer is going to love you enough to not approve of what you're doing. But throw you a lifeline. His name is Jesus. And he can save your soul and set you free. And this is why. Your testimony out here is so important. Everybody online, everybody in the sanctuary, you are the gospel written on your hearts. You're a testimony of all these sins. Come on, come on. Not some of them, all of them. In Corinthians, the Bible says, and such were some of you before you were saved. But once we become a Christian, we embrace the truth. We don't suppress it. We embrace it. And we embrace the Holy Spirit to empower us to live a righteous life. So my beloved family, I have done my best today to represent Romans chapter 1 in the manner which I believe Paul was relaying it. With both conviction, but yet with compassion. He did not want anybody to die in their sin. Neither do I. Neither do you. This is why, church, every time, every time we have an opportunity to celebrate a baptism, it's someone that God has brought from death to life. And we thank God. Amen? We thank God. So before we celebrate these baptisms, to every person that heard this message online today, not only do I love you, which is secondary God loves you more than me God loves you more than any person on this planet he's given you an opportunity to come to knowing today right where you are right where you're watching this if you find yourself entrapped you have suppressed the truth you've embraced a lie you can be free from it right now repent of that lie repent of that sin Surrender your life to Jesus and ask Him to save your soul and He will set you free. He will give you the power to overcome your sin and your flesh. No excuses. I end with this. No excuses. There is no excuse to suppress truth. There is no excuse to commit idolatry. 
There is no excuse to commit immorality. And there is no excuse to practice sin. Listen. And there's no excuse to approve of those who do. We love people. We love people to tell them the truth. Amen, church. Glory to Almighty God, the God of creation, the God of our very lives. We love you. We love you. Church, would you put your hands together right now and thank God for who he is, for who he is. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the message today or God was speaking something into your heart and you'd love to learn how to connect with Still Creek Church in a deeper way, uh, we'd love for you to visit our website at stillcreek.org. Find out how you can connect or find a group or a class or when our next discipleship series is being released. Uh, but the most direct way and immediate way to connect with us is by pulling out your phone right now and texting SC Connect to 94000. Uh, once you filled out that guest connection card, we're going to follow up and just see where you are and what's happening in your life and how we can serve and pray for you in a meaningful way. Uh, so until then, thanks again for being here. You can find more videos, sermons, and other resources on our YouTube page so you can continue to watch and allow God to just speak to you in a deep way. So we love you. We thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon.